Book Talk begins at 12 minutes and 16 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 633, Vibes. This episode of Craftlet was brought to you by our fabulous patrons over at patreon.com slash craftlet. Five of those fabulous patrons are Charlotte D., Lily M., Lynn S.B., Julie K., and Lori H. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world. Thank you. Also, people over on Patreon... Let us know if it's okay for me to say your last name. I've been cautious about reading out people's last names. I don't know if I need to be. The world has changed so much since 2006. So yeah, let me know. Maybe if you don't want your last name read, DM me over on Patreon. And I'll just assume if I don't hear from you that it's okay for me to read your name. All right, cool. So last week I did not announce the new raffle. But I'm announcing it right now. This month, the month of October 2023, we are raffling off one of Listener Tracy's brand spanking new and beautifully designed journals. We will have links out to where you can purchase these if you would like to support Tracy and all of the good that she has done for Craftlet over the last three years. She has been on every Zoom call regardless of what's been going on in her own life, which is kind of amazing. But then she's an amazing person, which of course is not a surprise being a Craftlet listener. All Craftlet listeners are fabulous people, but I did definitely want to highlight the work that Tracy's done on this journal. It's really, really lovely. And we will have pictures of it in the show notes for you to see. And then over on Rafflecopter. We'll have the link from the show notes over to the Rafflecopter, and you will be able to sign up for a chance to win one for your very own self. Along with fighting against Patreon's organizational structures on the the pages where we share the links, the posts to episodes and updates and things like that, along with trying to wrangle that into submission, Producer Eric has been also entering all of the information of all of the episodes, that would be 633 episodes, over on an online database called Airtable. We'll be linking out to this from our link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Craftlet channel. I'm going to have to figure out a way to dive back into WordPress and hope it doesn't hurt my brain, because I really need to add this to the sidebar. But yeah, long COVID and thinking, not such good friends. I know I've said it before, but it's true. It's also why this episode is called Vibes. One of the things that I'm going to be writing about this week over on initforthelonghaul.substack.com is about this research that's been done on vagus nerve stimulation And along with that, binaural beats. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I got a response from the owner, designer, I think designer, of the Brainwaves app that I've talked about before as doing the binaural beats. I did not realize just, I mean, it still looks like the app was designed in 2013, which I think it was, and it still looks like that. I did not catch all of the things that they were doing on the flip side. They've now made it possible that you could listen to YouTube. So whether that means like Baroque music on YouTube, that's good for studying or listen to a video essay that you just want to listen to or a sewing tutorial that you just want to listen to, you don't need to watch. You can play that on your device and have the binaural beats play under them. 
you can tell it where you want it to draw extra ambient audio from. This is crazy. All of the other apps do it all. It's like they'll play, you know, ocean wave sound, plus, if you're lucky, some kind of binaural frequency. This takes it so much further. And the reason why I bring it up is because, and the reason why it's called Vibes, is because the guy, when he wrote back to me, lovely gentleman, he gave me specifics, like for long COVID, da-da-da-da-da. But even more important than long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome, his app and what his app can do is specifically right now being used to help people with Alzheimer's. I'm going to try and find the research on that so that I can share that out with you too. That may be a thing too far for my brain. But if you yourself wind up finding out any of the research that's been done around binaural rhythms and Alzheimer's symptom relief, please share it with me at heather at craftlet.com. I would love to be able to add that information to the post I'm going to write today. The other thing I wanted to mention that's related to the long COVID stuff is I think I teased this last week, but since then we've gotten more samples in. One of the things that's really frustrating about having CFS or long COVID is that you don't look sick. So you still have to wear a mask because if we get COVID again, it's only going to be worse for us. So once you're in the long COVID CFS world, it's like being immunocompromised. It's not, but it is like being immunocompromised in that you have to kind of go out of your way to protect yourself. That can be very hard to do and uncomfortable. And so the kids and I have been designing a set of masks that say either like this is the face of long COVID or this is what long COVID looks like. And we're making the font big enough so that people will see it and know that they could ask a question like, wait, what? Because I'm finding more and more people who don't know that long COVID exists, which is crazy to me. So we finally got some samples back and none of them are 100% perfect. None of them are exactly what I would like to make. So I'm trying to make fabric on spoon flour that will be literally cut this out and sew on these lines and that will have the, the mask text on it. So it'll be like a DIY fabric pattern thing. So we're working on that. I don't know if that's going to work out. But in the meantime, to hold you, there are these masks over on the Etsy shop, the Relentlessly Curious shop. And along with that, I am adding specific images to a couple of the masks because I think personally that they both needed some tweaking in the nose region. Masks don't work very well if they don't at least seal over your nose or around the top of your nose. None of the masks that are available have nose wires in them specifically, but that doesn't mean they can't be added. So I have on the Etsy shop for those masks in particular, I have ways that you can customize your mask. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility. I can also tell you what size my head is, <laughs> so you, you will know just how big or not something is going to be to fit over your, your head. This week, Eric saw something go by, like a blip go by, saying that we had a message on the voicemail line, but neither of us can find it. So if you called 206-350-1642 over the last week or two, we didn't get it. So please, please resend. We really searched. We have no idea where that went. So we couldn't find the call eight voicemails, but listener Jill did find an eye river. And because I was talking about missing my eye river, she wrote to me and said, hey, I've got one that's going to go to the Goodwill. Do you want it? Yes, I do. Hers is fancy schmancy or more than mine was, but it's still an eye river and it makes me so happy. And I have it right now around my neck on a lanyard and it's just, it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it feels, <laughs> it's kind of like, 
This is how God meant podcast to be transmitted. RSS feed downloaded to your iRiver. This is so old school, the kids are going to crack up and look at me like, yeah, okay, mom, whatever. But thank you, Jill. It got here super fast and all in one piece and happy as a clam and immediately went around my neck. <laughs> so thank you. I wanted to announce our book party book for the end of this month, last Thursday in October. The book to read and then join in the fun conversating about is The Editor by Stephen Rowley. This is one of those quirky, fun books. Eric, producer Eric, recommended it. I immediately picked it up. The guy who is reading it has narrated all the books. He's like Scott Brick. He has narrated so many books. So if you're going to listen, it's a good listen. If you're going to read, it's a fun read. And yeah, and then we'll talk about it. So anyone at the Jane Eyre level over on Patreon or above, you will be able to join us at the end of this month for our book party. We'll put a link to the editor, both in purchasing it in paper, actual paper paper, and also a link out to Audible. All right. Our chapter today, I'm only doing one chapter today because this is kind of a big deal. That It's a big deal day, but it's also a big deal week. Today is Andrew's 60th birthday. I know. I'm in shock, too. It's almost as weird as the kid's you know, turning or almost turning 20. Where does it go? I don't know. But there's a lot planned and I don't have a lot of spoons <laughs> that I can use. So I am pacing myself. And one of the ways I'm pacing myself is by making sure that I don't overdo in anything that requires thinking. So I did not pursue some of the rabbit holes that I could have gone down. I recognize them as rabbit holes. I will let you know that they're rabbit holes, and then I'm going to let them go. So before we listen to our chapter today, chapter 34, I need to give you some memory refreshes, a little memory check. If you remember Aramis and the whole handkerchief episode, the handkerchief belonged to Madame Chavreuse, who was one of the Queen's trustworthy friends. So of course, what happens to her? Richelieu exiles her to Tours, T-O-U-R-S. You're going to hear references to her and Tours popping back up. Don't forget D'Artagnan's father's speech. I was talking to the kids about the book and mentioned that it was very much like Polonius's speech to Laertes, that it's just kind of ridiculous. Like, fight everybody, do all the things, don't sell the horse for less than 20 livres. You know, it was all of that stuff. At which point, D'Artagnan sold the horse for practically nothing, the yellow horse, but did proceed to fight everyone. And of course, that's how he made his best friends. So I guess his dad was right about something, even if it was the hot-headed side of the thumpsings that his dad gave him information on. Mendicant comes up again. It's one of those words that really still just sticks out to me. I don't know if it's because my brain is foggy or if it's just because... Yeah, every time I hear it, I have to actually stop and think, oh yeah, beggar, okay. Today's chapter is one of those kind of placeholder chapters where we're really just moving pieces on the chessboard. My guess is this chapter was originally released with the next two chapters. And like I said, I'm just not able to do that for you this week. But it would have made a lot of sense for this chapter to be the first one in one of the serialized publications there's not a lot that's going to happen. However, that doesn't mean there's no comedy. The thing that I think is interesting about this chapter is that the comedy is held largely by the lackeys. It's Mousqueton, Porthos's lackey, and Bazin, Aramis's lackey, who carry most of the humor. It's interesting because they're definitely playing off of tropes here, is what Dumas is doing. Just like the Gravedigger at the end of Hamlet is the comic relief for people who've been on their feet for three hours. Here we've got the two lackeys doing, it's not so much vaudeville routines as it is playing off their stereotype and kind of the stereotype shorthand for them and their master. So 
just like I think we talked about before a couple of weeks ago, that it's almost like the lackey starts to look like their employer. So Muscaton starts to act and think like Porthos. Bazin starts to act and think like Aramis, at least his version of good Aramis, which would be religious Aramis. You're going to see the lackeys being kind of funny reflections of their employers. One of the rabbit holes I did not go down, and I know somebody knows this. I remember from doing Bertolt Brecht's play Galileo. Well, we didn't do it. We did a staged reading of it at school in a translation that is not public. It was translated by our professor, and it's so much better than the one that got published. But the guy who got the rights to publish his translations of Brecht's art, it was exclusive, and there's been no other way to get around it, at least not so much, not so far, not yet. But one of the things that I remember from that play is that Galileo, when he knew he was being watched by the church, when he knew he was in trouble, he was smuggling out pages of his work, his research, his science, in different people's, the linings of their garments. This is something that's been done for a long time. It's not unique to Galileo. It could be apocryphal when it comes to Galileo, but I, I don't think so. But you're going to actually have that factor into part of today's chapter, that kind of movement of contraband. And the last rabbit hole that I started to go down and then pulled back on is we're going to hear for the second time two different poets be named specifically by Alexandre Dumas. The last time we saw stuff like this happening was in The Count of Monte Cristo when he was trying to publicize his friend's art. This time it's different because he is talking about historical figures, but they overlap in an interesting way. First, there's Vincent Voiture, who seems to have had a perfect life. 1597 to 1648, he did not live long, long, but he lived well and was in the Académie Française, which Dumas was never allowed into, the, the literary academy. But he was a poet. As poets, both of them had interactions with Richelieu, well, Richelieu and or Queen Anne and or Louis XIII and Louis XIV. So they overlap in a lot of different places. The work that Voiture did was very popular and it became kind of a thing. He was part of a movement. It was almost like Oscar Wilde and the Esthetes. Here you have Voiture and the Precieuse, the Precious Ones. And it, it became kind of a style in, certainly in literature and poetry, and eventually becomes something that Moliere very specifically mocks later on in, in his plays. However, this is the origin of the word precious being used the way it can be now. You can use it like, oh, isn't she a precious little baby? And you mean it. But it can also mean, like I've had to say when I was working on writing the trainings for COVID and I was working with people who didn't know me very well, I every time sat down and said, look, I am not precious about my writing. If something needs to be changed to make it better, then we change it to make it better. You make it the change and make it better. I'm not precious about it. That kind of usage of the word precious comes from here. There you go. The second poet who gets mentioned is Isaac de Benesserat. He was in Normandy. He lived from 1613 to 91. And again, he's a little later than voiture, but also super important. And where I stopped myself from going down massive rabbit holes is this. I remember at UCLA learning from one of our theater professors that the Louis at Versailles often did crazy things like pneumachia, like sea battles that were enacted, reenacted on some of the fountains and the ponds and the lakes and all of that stuff. But there was another thing that they did, 
at Versailles, and that was they had a, a labyrinth. And there was a very specific event where 39 separate hydraulic sculptures, these are pumping water sculptures, were posted at various points during, as you would go through the labyrinth. They were all referring to Aesop's fables and some little lesson. And Isaac de Benserade wrote quatrains that were placed on plaques that you would be able to read at each one of these fabulous sculptures spitting water. And some of them were timed so that it looked like the two animals or entities that were being portrayed in that particular work of hydraulic awesomeness. It would look like the water was going at different times, so it looked like the water was them talking to each other. I mean, how cool is that, right? Where did I stop myself? I stopped myself from trying to find sketches <laughs> of that, because that was just going to take me forever and make my head hurt. And the other thing that was really cool that connects back to what Judy called in about a couple weeks ago, Charles Perrault and Beauty and the Beast and all of those things, Charles Perrault was inspired by De Benserad. So that's you know, bringing it full circle, wrapping it all around. All righty, that's it. We are ready to listen to chapter 34 of The Three Musketeers, written by Alexandre Dumas. If you are listening to your own version of the audio, you can skip ahead to 40 minutes and 56 seconds. Otherwise, here we go. Chapter 34 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which the equipment of Aramis and Porthos is treated of. Since the four friends had been each in search of his equipments, there had been no fixed meeting between them. They dined apart from one another, wherever they might happen to be, or rather where they could. Duty likewise on its part took a portion of that precious time which was gliding away so rapidly, only they had agreed to meet once a week, about one o'clock, at the residence of Athos, seeing that he, in agreement with the vow he had formed, did not pass over the threshold of his door. This day of reunion was the same day as that on which Kitty came to find D'Artagnan. Soon as Kitty left him, D'Artagnan directed his steps toward the Rue Ferru. He found Athos and Aramis philosophizing. Aramis had some slight inclination to resume the cassock. Athos, according to his system, neither encouraged nor dissuaded him. Athos believed that everyone should be left to his own free will. He never gave advice but when it was asked, and even then he required to be asked twice. "'People in general,' he said, "'only ask advice not to follow it, or if they do follow it, it is for the sake of having someone to blame for having given it. Porthos arrived a minute after D'Artagnan. The four friends were reunited. The four countenances expressed four different feelings, that of Porthos, tranquility, that of D'Artagnan, hope, that of Aramis, uneasiness, that of Athos, carelessness. At the end of a moment's conversation in which Porthos hinted that a lady of elevated rank had condescended to relieve him from his embarrassment, Mousqueton entered. He came to request his master to return to his lodgings, where his presence was urgent, as he piteously said, "'Is it my equipment?' "'Yes and no,' replied Mousqueton. "'Well, but can't you speak?' "'Come, monsieur.' Porthos rose, saluted his friends, and followed Mousqueton. An instant after, Bazin made his appearance at the door. "'What do you want with me, my friend?' said Aramis, with that mildness of language which was observable in him every time that his ideas were directed toward the church. "'A man wishes to see monsieur at home,' replied Bazin. "'A man? What man?' "'A mendicant.' "'Give him alms, Bazin, and bid him pray for a poor sinner. "'This mendicant insists upon speaking to you.' and pretends that you will be very glad to see him. Has he sent no particular message for me? Yes, if Monsieur Aramis hesitates to come, he said, tell him I am from Tours. 
"'From Tor,' cried Aramis. "'A thousand pardons, gentlemen, but no doubt this man brings the news I expected.' And rising also, he went off at a quick pace. There remained Athos and D'Artagnan. "'I believe these fellows have managed their business. What do you think, D'Artagnan?' said Athos. "'I know that Porthos was in a fair way,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And as to Aramis, to tell you the truth, I have never been seriously uneasy on his account. But you, my dear Athos, you, who so generously distributed the Englishman's pistoles, which were our legitimate property, what do you mean to do?' "'I am satisfied with having killed that fellow, my boy, seeing that it is blessed bread to kill an Englishman. But if I had pocketed his pistoles, they would have weighed me down like a remorse. Go to, my dear Athos, you have truly inconceivable ideas. Let it pass. What do you think of Monsieur de Treville telling me, when he did me the honor to call upon me yesterday, that you associated with the suspected English whom the cardinal protects? That is to say, I visit an Englishwoman, the one I named. Oh, I, the fair woman on whose account I gave you advice, which naturally you took care not to adopt. I gave you my reasons. Yes. You look there for your outfit, I think you said. Not at all. I have acquired certain knowledge that that woman was concerned in the abduction of Madame Bonacieux. Yes, I understand now. To find one woman, you court another. It is the longest road, but certainly the most amusing. D'Artagnan was on the point of telling Athos all, but one consideration restrained him. Athos was a gentleman, punctilious in points of honor, and there were in the plan which our lover had devised for Milady, he was sure, certain things that would not obtain the assent of this Puritan. He was therefore silent, and as Athos was the least inquisitive of any man on earth, D'Artagnan's confidence stopped there. We will therefore leave the two friends, who had nothing important to say to each other, and follow Aramis. Upon being informed that the person who wanted to speak to him came from Tours, we have seen with what rapidity the young man followed, or rather went before, Bazin. He ran without stopping from the Rue Fahou to the Rue de Vargard. On entering, he found a man of short stature and intelligent eyes, but covered with rags. "'You have asked for me?' said the musketeer. "'I wish to speak with Monsieur Aramis. Is that your name, monsieur?' "'My very own. You have brought me something.' "'Yes, if you show me a certain embroidered handkerchief.' "'Here it is,' said Aramis, taking a small key from his breast and opening a little ebony box inlaid with mother-of-pearl. "'Here it is. Look.' "'That is right,' replied the mendicant. "'Dismiss your lackey.' In fact, Bazin, curious to know what the mendicant could want with his master, kept pace with him as well as he could, and arrived almost at the same time he did. But his quickness was not of much use to him. At the hint from the mendicant, his master made him a sign to retire, and he was obliged to obey. Bazin gone, the mendicant cast a rapid glance around him in order to be sure that nobody could either see or hear him, and opening his ragged vest, badly held together by a leather strap, he began to rip the upper part of his doublet, from which he drew a letter. Aramis uttered a cry of joy at the sight of the seal, kissed the superscription with an almost religious respect, and opened the epistle which contained what follows. My friend, it is the will of fate that we should be still for some time separated, but the delightful days of youth are not lost beyond return. Perform your duty in camp, I will do mine elsewhere. Accept that which the bearer brings you. Make the campaign like a handsome, true gentleman, and think of me who kisses tenderly your black eyes. Adieu, or rather, au revoir. The mendicant continued to rip his garments and drew from amid his rags a hundred and fifty Spanish double pistoles, which he laid down on the table. Then he opened the door, bowed, and went out before the young man, stupefied by his letter, had ventured to address a word to him. Aramis then reperused the letter and perceived a postscript. P.S. 
you may behave politely to the bearer, who is a count and a grandee of Spain. Golden dreams, cried Aramis. Oh, beautiful life. Yes, we are young. Yes, we shall yet have happy days. My love, my blood, my life. All, all, all are thine, my adored mistress. And he kissed the letter with passion, without even vouchsafing a look at the gold which sparkled on the table. Bazin scratched at the door, and as Aramis had no longer any reason to exclude him, he bade him come in. Bazin was stupefied at the sight of the gold, and forgot that he came to announce D'Artagnan, who, curious to know who the mendicant could be, came to Aramis on leaving Athos. Now, as D'Artagnan used no ceremony with Aramis, seeing that Bazin forgot to announce him, he announced himself. "'The devil, my dear Aramis,' said D'Artagnan, "'if these are the prunes that are sent to you from Tours, I beg you will make my compliments to the gardener who gathers them.' "'You are mistaken, friend D'Artagnan,' said Aramis, always on his guard. "'This is from my publisher.' who has just sent me the price of that poem in one syllable verse which I began yonder. Ha! Indeed, said D'Artagnan. Well, your publisher is very generous, my dear Aramis. That's all I can say. How, monsieur, cried Bazin, a poem sells so dear as that? It is incredible. Oh, monsieur, you can write as much as you like. You may become equal to Monsieur de Voiture and Monsieur de Bensorade. I like that. A poet is as good as an abbe. Ah, Monsieur Aramis, become a poet, I beg of you. Bazin, my friend, said Aramis, I believe you meddle with my conversation. Bazin perceived he was wrong. He bowed and went out. Ah, said D'Artagnan with a smile. You sell your productions at their weight in gold. You are very fortunate, my friend, but take care or you will lose that letter which is peeping from your doublet, and which also comes, no doubt, from your publisher. Aramis blushed to the eyes, crammed in the letter, and rebuttoned his doublet. My dear D'Artagnan, said he, if you please, we will join our friends. As I am rich, we will today begin to dine together again, expecting that you will be rich in your turn. "'My faith,' said D'Artagnan with great pleasure, "'it is long since we have had a good dinner, and I, for my part, have a somewhat hazardous expedition for this evening, and shall not be sorry, I confess, to fortify myself with a few glasses of good old Burgundy.' "'Agreed. As to the old Burgundy, I have no objection to that.' said Aramis, from whom the letter and the gold had removed, as by magic, his ideas of conversion. And having put three or four double pistoles into his pocket to answer the needs of the moment, he placed the others in the ebony box, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, in which was the famous handkerchief which served him as a talisman. The two friends repaired to Athos's, and he, faithful to his vow of not going out, took upon him to order dinner to be brought to them. As he was perfectly acquainted with the details of gastronomy, D'Artagnan and Aramis made no objection to abandoning this important care to him. They went to find Porthos, and at the corner of the Rue Bac met Mousqueton, who, with a most pitiable air, was driving before him a mule and a horse. D'Artagnan uttered a cry of surprise, which was not quite free from joy. "'Ah, ha, my yellow horse!' cried he. "'Aramis, look at that horse!' "'Oh, the frightful brute!' said Aramis. "'Ah, my dear!' replied D'Artagnan. "'Upon that very horse I came to Paris.' "'What does monsieur know his horse?' said Mousqueton. "'It is of an original color,' said Aramis. "'I never saw one with such a hide in my life.' "'I can well believe it,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And that was why I got three crowns for him.' It must have been for his hide, for, Gertes, the carcass is not worth eighteen livres. But how did this horse come into your hands, Mousqueton? Pray, said the lackey, say nothing about it, monsieur. It is a frightful trick of the husband of our duchess. How is that, Mousqueton? Why, we are looked upon with a rather favorable eye by a lady of quality, the duchess de... But, your pardon, 
my master has commanded me to be discreet. She had forced us to accept a little souvenir, a magnificent Spanish genet, and an Andalusian mule which were beautiful to look upon. The husband heard of the affair. On their way he confiscated the two magnificent beasts, which were being sent to us, and substituted these horrible animals. "'Which you are taking back to him?' said D'Artagnan. "'Exactly,' replied Mousqueton. "'You may well believe that we will not accept such steeds as these in exchange for those which had been promised to us.' "'No, pardieu, though I should like to have seen Porthos on my yellow horse. That would give me an idea of how I looked when I arrived in Paris. But don't let us hinder you, Mousqueton. Go and perform your master's orders. Is he at home?' "'Yes, monsieur,' said Mousqueton, "'but in a very ill humor. Get up!' He continued his way toward the Quai des Grand Augustin, while the two friends went to ring at the bell of the unfortunate Porthos. He, having seen them crossing the yard, took care not to answer, and they rang in vain. Meanwhile, Mousqueton continued on his way, and crossing the Pont Neuf, still driving the two sorry animals before him, he reached the Rue Aor. Arrived there, he fastened, according to the orders of his master, both horse and mule to the knocker of the procurator's door. Then, without taking any thought for their future, he returned to Porthos and told him that his commission was completed. In a short time, the two unfortunate beasts, who had not eaten anything since the morning, made such a noise in raising and letting fall the knocker that the procurator ordered his errand boy to go and inquire in the neighborhood to whom this horse and mule belonged. Madame Coquenard recognized her present, and could not at first comprehend this restitution, but the visit of Porthos soon enlightened her. The anger which fired the eyes of the musketeer in spite of his efforts to suppress it terrified his sensitive inamorata. In fact, Mousqueton had not concealed from his master that he had met D'Artagnan and Aramis, and that D'Artagnan in the yellow horse had recognized the Béarnese pony upon which he had come to Paris and which he had sold for three crowns. Porthos went away after having appointed a meeting with the procurator's wife in the cloister of St. Magloire. The procurator, seeing he was going, invited him to dinner, an invitation which the musketeer refused with a majestic air. Madame Coquenard repaired trembling to the cloister of St. Magloire, for she guessed the reproaches that awaited her there, but she was fascinated by the lofty airs of Porthos, all that which a man wounded in his self-love could let fall in the shape of imprecations and reproaches upon the head of a woman, Porthos let fall upon the bowed head of the procurator's wife. Alas, said she, I did all for the best. One of our clients is a horse-dealer. He owes money to the office and is backward in his pay. I took the mule and the horse for what he owed us. He assured me that they were two noble steeds. "'Well, madame,' said Porthos, "'if he owed you more than five crowns, your horse-dealer is a thief.' "'There is no harm in trying to buy things cheap, Monsieur Porthos,' said the procurator's wife, seeking to excuse herself. "'No, madame, but they who so assiduously try to buy things cheap ought to permit others to seek more generous friends.' And Porthos, turning on his heel, made a step to retire." Monsieur Porthos, Monsieur Porthos, cried the procurator's wife. I have been wrong, I see it. I ought not to have driven a bargain when it was to equip a cavalier like you. Porthos, without reply, retreated a second step. The procurator's wife fancied she saw him in a brilliant cloud, all surrounded by duchesses and marchionesses who cast bags of money at his feet. "'Stop, in the name of heaven, Monsieur Porthos!' cried she. "'Stop, and let us talk!' "'Talking with you brings me misfortune,' says Porthos. "'But tell me, what do you ask?' "'Nothing, for that amounts to the same thing as if I asked you for something.' The procurator's wife hung upon the arm of Porthos, and in the violence of her grief she cried out, Monsieur Porthos, I am ignorant of all such matters. How should I know what a horse is? How should I know what horse furniture is? 
You should have left it to me, then, madame, who know what they are, but you wish to be frugal, and consequently to lend at usury. It was it was wrong, Monsieur Porthos, but I will repair that wrong upon my word of honor. How so? asked the musketeer. Listen, this evening Monsieur Coquenard is going to the house of the Duc de Chaune, who has sent for him. It is for a consultation which will last three hours at least. Come, we shall be alone and can make up our accounts. In good time, now you talk, my dear. You pardon me? We shall see, said Porthos majestically, and the two separated, saying, Till this evening. The devil, thought Porthos as he walked away. It appears I am getting nearer to Monsieur Coquenard's strong box at last. End of chapter 34. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. So I was left with a bunch of question marks after this chapter. Some of them that I knew I wouldn't be able to answer until much later. But some of them, I thought, this is Dumas doing something here. This is on purpose. So I already mentioned the poets who he mentioned, who I really honestly think were just poets that he liked from this time period. So he liked getting a chance to say something nice about them. But I also kept thinking it was so weird in the scene with Aramis getting the letter from Madame Chevreuse that after he had let the beggar, who was clearly not a beggar, who ripped his the lining of his clothes open to pull out all of the, the money and the letter and all that stuff. Why tell us after he's left, oh, and you need to treat him well, he's actually a Spanish count? I didn't know if this was like a good Samaritan thing, like just reminding people you should treat strangers and strangers who seem to be worse off than you, you should treat them kindly. Or if something else was going on here, I had a bunch of different ideas. Of course, I can't remember any of them now. Those were the questions I was thinking of. Those were the, the ideas that came to me as I was walking down the steps to record. And of course, they're gone now. So if you have an idea of what was going on here, please share 206-350-1642 or heather at craftlit.com. I also thought, I thought it was interesting that Aramis, who knows that D'Artagnan knows about Madame Chevreuse, at least somewhat, is still playing up the, no, 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 the money I got, I got from my, uh, my publisher. Yeah, that's it, my publisher. But then I started trying to think back, does he actually know that D'Artagnan knows? I don't think D'Artagnan let on that he knew, right? He held that one. I know he hid Porthos's non-Duchess Duchess. Which, of course, now Mousqueton is doing. So in the previous chapter, when Porthos was like, but I gave up this woman for you, and that woman for you, and this woman for you, all of those were like Countess dot dot dot, Baroness dot dot dot. All of them were punctuated this way. This in this text was Mousqueton saying the Duchess dot dot dot. Oh, but I'm not supposed to talk about that. We don't want to brag. I love that. And poor Bazin. Oh, my God. Well, I guess a poet is almost as good as an abbe. Sure, sweetheart. You just keep yourself warm at night with that. I'm trying to remember if this is the last time we're going to see D'Artagnan's horse. <laughs> I actually don't think it is. I'm trying to remember several laters on in the book, and I cannot remember for, for certain, but I think we do see it one more time. And, and I love the, I would have paid good money to see Porthos on that horse. I also thought, okay, Mousqueton and Porthos, I thought that was really clever. The horses were an insult to them. Them returning the horses was an insult to the procurer. But I really thought it was clever that they tied the horses to the door knocker so that every time the horses moved backwards or forwards, that knocker was going to hit. That would be so random and annoying a noise. And probably kind of loud if it's a big door knocker and they are big animals who can pull on it. And if they loosen up the tension, that thing's going to drop in a hurry and go boom. 
I also thought, and this is the last thing, I also thought it was interesting that Dumas made it clear that Porthos saw D'Artagnan and Aramis coming to see him. Sees that they have an exchange with Mousqueton as he's taking the animals away and decides he doesn't want to answer the door. It's just one of those things where I'm thinking, I can't tell. I just can't tell if moments like these that kind of stand out as odd behaviors, if they're not playing on a trope that was popular at the time or riffing off another story that was popular at the time, which would be very hard to track down, but would also explain several things that we've seen happen already and also several things that we are going to see happen shortly. I am just not sure. But it's something to uh, contemplate. And if you have any genius ideas, I think you should share them. 206-350-1642 or heather at craftlit.com. And with that, I leave you. I have to go lie down now. You take care of yourself. And I'll talk to you next week after the big birthday weekend. Take care. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. 